this week on the WriterCon podcast. Whether you are writing great literature or terrible literature or genre fiction or poetry, you have got to recognize that you're going to write really bad literature most of the time. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Laura Bernhardt, award-winning author of the Wantland Files book series. Thank you, Jesse Ulrich. And hey there, writers. Thanks for joining us again. Laura is not with us for this or the next podcast because she had some other stuff she had to take care of. However, we recorded the interviews in advance, so you will get to hear her lovely dulcet tones during the interview, just not on all the other stuff. As we're recording this, I'm literally about uh, two days away from leaving for the WriterCon retreat on Wednesday, which this year is at Cane Break, which is a luxury resort in Wagner, Oklahoma. It's not far from Tulsa. It's not nearly as isolated as it seems, but it's isolated enough to give you this glorious environment for doing your best writing work while getting instruction and feedback from really cool people, like not only me and Laura, but also agent Amy Brewer is coming out and uh, USA Today best-selling romance author with more than 80 titles in print. Good grief. Lauren Smith uh, is like 10 years ago. She was in my, <laughs> one, of, one of these retreats just like this and now she's got more than 80 books. Wow. Also getting Rachel Bradley there to talk about uh, editing. So I think it's going to be a really good time. The only downside, Jesse, is that you're not going to be there. That is true. That is true. I I, I apologize for all the people going to the retreat that I'm not going to be there. <laughs> they I, wanted to I, miss you. That was I meet you. That was the whole thing. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to go teach uh, youths how to be good leaders. Um, oh, yeah. What's, I know. What's Michelle doing? Maybe she could come down. Now, listen, I'll tell her. Book. Okay. I'll tell her. I mean, yeah, absolutely. All right. Our interview today, I don't want to waste too much time because we have one of the most best-selling superstar authors we've ever had, Eloisa James. She's the author of over 30 historical romances, plus a contemporary novel, Lizzie and Dante, and a memoir, Paris in Love. What hasn't she done? Not much. And along the way, she's published over seven, I mean, she's uh, over 7 million copies of her books have been published in 28 languages and 30 countries. So there's a lot there to talk about. But first, the news. We have two news stories today, and they're kind of related to one another, so be patient. Even though they're both actual new news stories, they also both involve AI, which you've probably heard something about lately, and Amazon, which we in the book world always hear about. This first story, though, is about a new platform that is offering authors unedited AI translations. And yeah, I'm talking about translations into foreign languages, which traditionally has been a very tr tough market for even traditionally published authors to crack. But talking about self-publishing authors, uh, almost impossible. Although Lauren Smith, who is coming to the retreat this weekend, has done it many, many times, but most people don't. Well, now there's a platform called Lean Pub, L E A N P U B. I'll put the uh, the the URL in the show notes. But this is a self-publishing platform plus an online bookstore that allows writers to write, publish, and sell eBooks from their site. They are now offering additionally what they call a global author service that will translate any book that's on their platform into eight or 31 languages. <laughs> you may be thinking, wait, that seems random, eight or 31. Well, the price for eight translations is 99 bucks, up to 40,000 words. 
And plus, the authors will receive a quarter of a cent, not a whole lot, per word for sales beyond that. So, you know, if you earn back uh, what that, that, that threshold amount, then you start getting paid more. The price raises to $249 for 31 languages. I mean, I'm not even sure I could name 31 languages. But at any rate, that's why it's three or 31 Trans, or eight or 31 translations, okay? Authors will still own their translations, and here's a good thing. You can sell them anywhere that allows AI translations to be sold, which I think is everywhere now, although some platforms are only circulating AI translations that were generated by them. I can guess your first question is the quality of these translations any good? And the answer, and this comes from Lean Pub's own rep, Len Epp, he said, good enough. <laughs> That's the end quote. <laughs> but part of that might be because he calls these translations what he calls prescriptive nonfiction books. In fact, look at that uh, screenshot that uh, mm. Jesse's showing you. Most of them relate to computers and computer programming and computer engineering and so forth. So, but, you know, Jesse, you, like Scotty on Star Trek, read technical journals, right? I do. I do. <laughs> so would you read an AI-translated technical journal? I mean... I suppose if we are talking about what we think AI can do reasonably well, something that isn't a lot of nuance and is more you know prescriptive and explanatory, I think this would be useful for people. I still think something's going to get lost in translation. Yeah. But, you know, again, like one of the categories is leadership. I feel like that's going to have a lot of terms and whatnot that are not going to translate well, that AI is not going to know how to translate well between uh, different languages, but who knows? Yeah, well, when Epp says good enough, it sounds like he's saying, well, you'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly yeah. clear. <laughs> if if they're allowing you to get it translated and then to also, like, do your own reviews of it, that would be a good tool. Like, if, you know, if you're just having someone review it after it's already been translated, yeah. that would cost you less. But I don't, I don't think, I don't think that that's what they're going for. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe they'll allow that. I don't know, but it doesn't seem to be what they're promoting. So the question is whether this is good news for writers or bad. You know, when we were talking about AI narrated audiobooks before, of course, many yeah. people were concerned that this is going to displace uh, human audiobook narrators. But the truth is, some people can't afford human audiobook narrators, and people, even successful people, can't always pony up the money for a foreign translation because that's putting a lot of money down for potentially small return so i could see this being even more popular but i don't know what do you think good for writers or bad i think it's good for writers i mean i again we don't like ai things that take away jobs from other people but sure. foreign translations is a whole other market that like for example english language writers uh, at certain tiers just don't have the resources to do. So this might be a good right. way of growing your right. audience. Right. So um, okay. this, as far as, yeah, as far as AI tools go, this one, this one's the least offensive we've, we've, we've spoken of. I feel like. Right. So. Although if they move beyond computer books and start doing legal thrillers, I might have different thoughts. But. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? Sure. Trying, I mean, the legal systems overseas aren't even the same, much less the terminology. That's true. So. That'd be interesting, actually. I'm, I'm curious about how we would do that. So, <laughs> Okay. Well, I'll say, well, Lean Pub's just doing computer, but somebody else will be doing fiction. In a oh, heartbeat, yeah, for sure. So, you know. Okay. New story number two, which is related. We recently got a very rare look into book sales at Amazon. This is rare because historically, Amazon never releases any kind of what they call granular data. And they apparently didn't release this either, but Business Insider somehow got a hold of this 25 page confidential document that includes data about Amazon's retail business, including their book business for the first 10 months of 2022. And I will tell you now, I will put the link to this report in the show notes. However, there's a paywall. So if you don't have a subscription to Business Insider, you won't be able to read it, which is why uh, 
Jesse is showing you a screenshot from someplace else because we didn't want to pay just to get for a screenshot to show on the podcast, right? That makes no sense. Anyway, so, uh, and for that matter, Business Insider hasn't made the whole document available, but we have enough to talk about. For instance, in the first 10 months of 2022, Amazon earned $16.9 billion, that's with a B, billion worldwide from its books categories. That's print, ebooks, audiobook. I'm just pointing that out because I think people think that the book market, which was what Amazon started with, is now a teeny tiny piece of its business. Well, Amazon sells everything now, basically, but books are still a huge part of their market, both here in the United States and abroad. In fact, FYI, from this report, we now know that the three largest overseas markets are the UK, Germany, and Japan. So if, say, you were paying somebody to translate your books, somebody who maybe gives you a bargain for only three translations, pick UK, Germany, and Japan, probably. Other good takeaways from this report had to do with the print digital split, you know, print books versus digital books for that same period of time. Here are the results according to the report, 456 million print books sold and 419 digital books. I mean, that's almost neck to neck. If that were a presidential election, people would refuse to call it in advance. But it does show slightly more print books, which is not what most people would have expected. You know, I live so much in the world of popular fiction where ebooks are clearly dominant that sometimes I make the mistake of thinking that's the whole world, but it's not. People still seem to prefer children's books, picture books, for instance, and hard covers and textbooks and a lot of nonfiction fields as well. And so that was interesting. Two more points. Japanese manga, it seems to be exploding. And, and I'm taking this from Michael Cater, who's done a very good analysis of this information. I'll also post notes to that. But he points out that the book scan reported sales for a similar period suggests that Amazon is responsible for selling, quote, an astonishing 77% of book scan units, in quote. Why is that astonishing? Because we normally think of the book scan or book scan uh, the data being point of purchase, you know, being primarily bookstores. But if 77% of those sales are going through Amazon, then that is just not true anymore. So for starters, Jesse, were you surprised by the sales numbers for print books versus eBooks? No, because I feel like we've talked about this a lot where there's a, uh, there's a, there's a growing trend of people wanting to read physical media and, right. and there are the group of people like myself who like to read eBooks, but own copies of said book. Um, and you know, it's one of those things where I think a lot of energy was too lately put in mm -hmm. how eBooks were popular. But, yeah. pe but people who liked eBooks already knew that and were already reading eBooks. Um, and now I think they're just like recognizing that people kind of want both. And yeah. that's a well, good thing. Now, wait a minute. You say you buy, you read the eBook, but then you get a print book what, just so you can put it on the shelf and yes. tell people you read it? <laughs> well, because I, I did read it. I just, it's easier to read on my Kindle than, especially the books I read, which are usually long fantasy or sci-fi books are not comfortable to to read in bed that's true. you so. know i'm teasing you but in fact way back when when i was younger than you uh and audiobooks were just starting to break out a long unabridged audiobooks yeah. i would listen to those audiobooks when i commuted to work or on business trips but i too would also buy the print book yeah. just yeah. to sort of remind myself i've read that you know i've done that one or maybe just so I can impress my friends, but I yeah. don't think I have any friends who are impressed by the books in my house. So that I, yeah, <laughs> I'm still uh, yeah, I'm still mad that Amazon never thought it was a good idea, or they couldn't convince the the publishers that like if I buy a hardback cover of a book, mm -hmm. I should get the ebook for free. Yeah, yeah, or. Vice versa, would that vice be versa, nice? Yeah. I mean, there yes. are play you can get the audio book and then get the yeah. print for an extra yeah. 
buck fifty usually yeah. at Amazon or something like that. Yeah. So. And what do you nice. think about this manga explosion? Is this going to be the year it finally takes off in the United States? Uh, it's one of those things where I think it just has two. It has it's a it has a name that is going to be too confusing to most Americans <laughs> you mean to really manga or yeah manga yeah I feel if like we just people, talked in comic books would that be okay yeah I think more people would understand it but again it's one of those things where it's been popular for a long time and it's just mm-hmm. enough of those people who are super into it are now making other things and talking about their love of manga so it's like it's mm-hmm. one of those. It's one of those growth things where like, you know, it used to be like being a Star Trek and Star Wars nerd was a bad thing. And now all those people are running uh, Hollywood, um, uh, different IPs. And so now it's cool again. Now it's mainstream, right? Yeah. So I feel like that's what's happening. Last poll I saw more than 50% of all Americans considered themselves Trekkies. And I thought, well, that's not how it was when I was 14. Nope. (laughs) Nope. That's not what my childhood was like at all. So. Yeah, is this just an age thing? Because you know I love comic books. And I love every kind of books. And I've read manga, but it still feels a little strange to me. You know, there, there. it's not just the art. The storytelling approach is, I think, different. Yeah. I'm specifically thinking about the Superman Mishi series where every mm. episode Superman flies to Japan and eats lunch at a different chain sushi restaurant Lo- love it. on it what a great idea thought, uh, yeah that wouldn't happen here in america so. no no it's i i think it's good to have different um culture storytelling tropes being incorporated into america like for example the three body problem which we talked about a lot yeah. like reading that book even though i'm reading the english translation was so different from any other sci-fi series i have oh, ever read and, and that's good that that it creates new ideas. It brings new things into the zeitgeist. It's a positive. Yeah. New way of telling stories. I totally agree with that when it's done really well. Yes. I probably just haven't read the definitive manga novel yet. What's the best one? Mm, I feel like that's an instant way to start an internet argument. So, (laughs) or at least get people to comment on the podcast. Yeah. Listeners, you tell us your favorite manga. All right. There you go. Get in the comments. All right. Enough of this chatter. Let us talk to Eloisa James. Eloisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. All right. Traditional first question. If you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Whether you are writing great literature or terrible literature or genre fiction or poetry, you have got to recognize that you're going to write really bad literature most of the time. That's my advice. My advice is that anything don't good worry about it. comes from editing. Yes, right, right. There'll be another draft later. That's what you're saying, right? There'll be I hope. many drafts. Yeah, yeah. Later, right. but even more than that. of the stuff you produce is schlock. You're going to have to learn to cut it. You can't edit that into a gem. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Needs to be cut. I think that that's such a good point too, because I some, sometimes think people think, well, I'm just starting when I get good at it, this will be easy. And my first drafts will go straight to the press. And uh, I think, uh, no, I've, written 64 books now and that has not happened yet so and i know you're well over 30 historical romances right right i am yeah i've written over 30 historical romances and a contemporary novel and a memoir and believe me every time i hand in the first draft i think this is brilliant this time my editor or my agent is just going to say wow you've never written so well and then yeah yeah, no. not the way it works. Well, tell but, us about the new one, which I think is Viscount in Love, right? Tell mm-hmm. us about Viscount. Viscount is a lot of fun because when you're writing historical romance, you need to find a way at looking at the past that's also looking at the present. And I got very interested in dyslexia because one of my students, um, because I'm a Shakespeare professor, one of my students who'd been my advisee for two years was diagnosed with dyslexia. And it never occurred to me for why he was such a bad speller. So I ended up thinking about dyslexia back back in the day, so to speak, in the Regency period. And I realized that everyone would simply decide you were stupid. Mm-hmm. That was it. 
And my student came to me with, you know, he'd had a tough time. Um, not being called stupid so much because, you know, Fordham is extremely supportive, but people being frustrated, unable to figure out why he couldn't, you know, comprehend faster, read faster, why he couldn't do these things. And um, and I loved his work. He's he's really creative. But but I also didn't I thought it was a problem of organization, maybe ADHD. You know, we go in various directions. I didn't think of dyslexia. Yeah. So. I learned really interesting things. For example, did you know that some dyslexic people can write in blue ink, but never in black ink? I have not heard that Didn't before, that. no. So my heroine, when my heroine gets married, she has to sign the, you know, the book behind the church. She cannot sign it in black ink. So her maid sneaks in a bottle of blue ink and the, <laughs> and the archbishop's wow. like, absolutely not. And her friend distracts him and she signs the book in blue ink. Oh, but basically I had a heroine whom everyone had decided is an idiot because she cannot read and she cannot write. And she's a painter. And the only thing she can paint are objects that are good for women to paint, which would be rabbits, bunnies, kittens, and flowers, right? <laughs> Mm. So that's who she is and Maybe she's a puppy <laughs> no no i didn't get into no puppies, puppies. No. With rabbits no. and kittens and flowers and so her sister is enormously um talented and able and and uh betrothed to a viscount who inherits two very eccentric children and mm. the sister promptly elopes with someone else and the viscount ends up marrying the woman whom he believes to be stupid and uh. He thinks spends his time painting flowers and rabbits mm -hmm. and occasional kitten. But I'm betting it turns out pretty well uh, at some point. You know, for those of you who are writing romance or but you know, I think it covers almost any kind of fiction. I really think that genre fiction lives or dies on comeuppance. You know, we think of romance always oh, all about falling in love. Actually, no, I think it's more about comeuppance. It's about, you know, that, that feeling of like, okay, the bad people got theirs and the good people. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, my heroine may be painting flowers, but she's the best flower painter in England. Mm -hmm. And that I was like fun. That. This is really fascinating. I never thought about a condition like that in the past. I mean, it's not new. It's just that we're learning new ways to acknowledge and assist with it. And that's, that's a brilliant idea you had. I love that. And I also like, how you're kind of bringing in the women's issues to your historical fiction. That sounds fascinating. I'm gonna have to read that. But but this is part of a series, right? Accidental Brides? Do I need to start with the first one? It is the first. Oh, it's going to start a new series. <laughs> yes. It Fantastic. Is perfect. Perfect starting point for me then. I love it. But you have several series, don't you? I do. I have many series. So I have um, The Wilds, which is about a... a, a kind of crazy family living on the edge of a bog with 13 children. Oh, um, that's an extremely popular one set in the Georgian period. So we're thinking about wigs rather than, you know, pretty dresses, Richardson style. And I have another one called Desperate Duchesses, which is also a very popular, um, really set around chess games. And because the Georgian period was much more racy than the Regency period. And so a lot of people were living separately from their husbands. So Desperate Duchesses oh. is about Duchesses who are not living with their husbands. Whoa. It was fun to write. That, that, mm, that sparks some ideas there. Interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah. You participated in Kindle Vela, the Kindle Vela program. Is that right? How did yep. that go for you? Did you enjoy I that experience it. or? I did. And for those of you who don't know, Kindle Vela is a serialization platform on the Amazon, you know, in the Amazon world. Mm -hmm. And the thing about having such a long career, and I'm sure, William, with your 64, if I got that right, 64 books, uh, you know, on Vela. You, <laughs> you have to keep challenging yourself. I mean, right. you know, something like Try this something is new. not going to come along every mm -hmm. minute. So with the serialization platform, it's been fabulous for me. I, I have a um, something called the seduction, which is the season, season one, two, three, four, and the seduction, two, um, two dances and a duke is the first one. But what it really taught me was how to write an episode so that someone will buy the next. Because yes. the whole point of serialization is that 
they don't have to buy the next. Mm -hmm. They don't have to continue. So how do you end a chapter in such a way that the person either puts down their money for another one or doesn't put the book down? It's like, wait, I've got to read one more chapter. That's what you're always going for with genre yes. fiction. I've got to read one more. I've got to read one more. So um, I ended up doing a lot of research on Dickens because, of course, Dickens yes. is our famous serializer. And there are wonderful letters in which he's writing to you know various authors and saying, if something doesn't happen in this book, I'm pulling your serialization because something has to happen in every chapter. So I learned a lot. And I think I'm... I've brought that forward into the new accidental duchesses. They're a little different. Great. Um, well, I think you've got a good formula down or a good system down because your books have been praised by just pretty much everyone, like every review periodical, Julia Quinn, author of the mm -hmm. Bridgerton series. I mean, that has to feel good, right? You talked about how yeah. you send in your first draft. and It maybe doesn't get the response you want at first, but to get those kinds of reviews, that has to be wonderful. Well, the reason why I answered that first question is because I've learned over the years, you, ha you have to acknowledge the work, right? You just have to accept that it's going to be a lot of work if you want those reviews. And frankly, if you want the sales. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think that's oh, just fantastic advice. You have one of the most interesting author biographies <laughs> I've had the pleasure to read since we did started doing this podcast. Uh, let me see if I've got all this straight. If I'm reading this correctly, you've got degrees from Harvard, Yale, and Oxford. Would that be correct? That's yep. like the trifecta of higher education, isn't it? <laughs> I know. <How> many, <laughs> yeah. You must have liked school a lot. Or <laughs> I did. I mean, I, I like, uh, I, I, I recognize hard work and if the, if I can see where I'm going, I just do it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, it turned out that was helpful. Yeah. It turned out well, as you just mentioned, you're a Shakespearean scholar, uh, professor. Where do you teach? And scholar, I'm sure too. Where <laughs> At Fordham university. Yeah. Uh, which is in New York city. Yeah. At where I think you live some of the time, but as you, uh, I don't remember if you mentioned it since we started the interview, but you're in Florence right now, right? So you live in Italy part of the time. It, what's that, during the summer maybe? Or how does that work? Exactly. My husband's Italian. So we have a house in Florence. And actually, my daughter moved here after college. So she's here. Oh, sweet. Mom and dad have a place in Florence. We didn't do that. How did we miss out on that, Laura? <laughs> it just slipped my mind. Maybe Disney World, but not Florence. Yes. Holy smokes. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay. So, and how did you segue? I'm going to assume you taught first, but somehow you made this movement from Shakespearean professor to best-selling author of historical romances. How did that happen? Well, my... My husband is Italian, which means yes. that he he didn't he was rather shocked by my student loans, and of course now <laughs> now thirty thousand dollars in student loans is nothing. Unfortunately, oh. my students often have far more. But back then, when we graduated, we both got our PhD at Yale, and uh, it was a tremendous amount of money. So we had one baby, and Alessandro felt frugally and responsibly that we couldn't have another baby because we had too much loans. But I had grown up the daughter of a poet, uh, Robert Bly, and a writer, Carol Bly. And when they wanted to do something, they simply wrote to HarperCollins, which is very ironic because they have been my publisher now for 30 years, and asked for an advance. And this is something that my my sister and I have agreed over the years was, um, you know, it had a profound effect on us as kids. You know, they would ask for an advance, and then my dad, we'd go to Norway for a year, or we'd go to Paris for a year. We'd go live in London for a year. And we'd go live in California, which frankly was like a foreign country if you're growing up at a farm in Minnesota. So um, so I decided, fine, I, I don't want to have one child. I grew up with six in the household. I have to pay off these student loans. And that means I have to write something. And I love, you know, reading romance. And uh, I mm -hmm. tried writing a mystery, which I also love to read. And I just couldn't get into the uh, murderer's point of view. So I tried a romance. <laughs> and it went up for... Uh, auction, yeah, you know, with publishers, and um, 
and it came in a, th a couple three thousand dollars over my student loans but for that i had to write three books nice and then i discovered i loved having an academic side where you know the book is every you know inch of it is going to be hauled over by other academics and argued about and having a romance where people simply write you and say i love this or i didn't love it and here's why and you know so it has been a great balance in my life i'm, mm -hmm. I'm very grateful now you brought this up so i assume that this is okay your father is robert bly one of the most successful and famous poets in american literature late passed a few years ago but national book award winner have you ever been tempted to write poetry? No. No? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Leave that to dad? Is that the yeah. idea? I spent my entire childhood with dad at dinner every night going, here's what I wrote. Or, you know, <laughs> but I mean, he would go through phases. So he would recite Yeats at dinner. And also, interestingly, I have a lot of memories of him reciting King Lear, which makes it a little really? more interesting wow. why I became a, a Shakespeare mm. But I have to share something funny that just happened, which is that um, uh, Taylor Swift has been mm -hmm. co-writing um, songs and she just, a co-written song was just released that said, Robert Bly on your bedside table. And I was like, oh, oh wow. Oh, nice name drop. In a Swift song. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. made it to Swift land. Oh, that's terrific. You wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times defending romance, romantic fiction. How did that come about? Well, actually they contacted me and said, it's gonna be Valentine's day. Can you please write something about bodice rippers? And I said, I can write something about why you shouldn't call them bodice rippers. There you go, <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> so yeah, I've done a lot of defending romance. I mean, I honestly feel that the same percentage of romance is good as literary fiction and believe me our poetry i mean i grew up one of my jobs as a kid was reading aloud to my dad his letters and then i would type the responses so in my adult life i've had a lot of people come up to me after talks after keynote and say i have one of your letters and they would say things like you know dear bob uh you know your poetry really isn't good you should concentrate on you know working in a thing and then it says ps and it says I'm Mary Bly, but I thought your poetry was good because I would try to mitigate what he said. After. Right, right. <laughs> I was like when I was seven. So, um. you know, I've I've struggled with that a little bit. I write literary fiction, but I also write like supernatural suspense and kind of like I I feel like one is serious and one is not so serious, and I've I've struggled with that. And Catherine Center told me at one point, don't. Um, don't dismiss what you're calling not serious fiction because everything is important to the reader who picks it up and reads it. It, it gives that reader exactly what they need. And I have quite a few friends who write romance. And I think some of it, we just tend to get a little defensive about that if we're not writing like the next great American novel. But when we get that feedback from our fans that tell us, how much difference it made for them or how it was it, it, it got them through a rough period i think it makes all the difference all literature all fiction has a place and is important so mm -hmm. i'm glad that you stepped up and were able to write that i'm glad you had the opportunity thank you i i think you should celebrate both i don't Absolutely. think you should accept shame as a reason for denigrating your own fiction i agree I no. I, I I like the reminder. I remind myself, right? Don't don't say I just write. Super. No, I do this. It's a good thing. I'm proud of it. That's right. I'm what good is, at this, and I'm that? good at this. That's mm, that's yeah. another one. I, I'm I'm good at this. What does a typical writing day look like for you? Do you do you have a very set process or a little more uh, open? I do. I'm in Italy right now, so that means that I write in the gazebo in the garden, which is Aww. nice. So I got very early in the morning and I write until it gets too hot. I have one of those fans that will spew air at me so I can stay, you know, wet air. Mm -hmm. um, I can stay up a little longer than I would, but I, I write in the morning and I write in 25 minute writing sprints and I often mm -hmm. write with friends. So I, I read at some point a few years ago that 25 minutes is the perfect concentration time and it does seem to work for me. So we 
turn off our computers and our sound and leave the Zoom on, 25 minutes of writing, turn it all back on, discuss where you are, see if anyone had any problems. I highly recommend it for anyone, no matter what Thing. stage so of like writing you're at. Writing in a group, it sounds like. It, yes, with other writing friends. Well, but you turn the sound and the, the computer off. So you have 25 minutes working on yours. Oh. But then you come back and you have five minutes of just like, wow, this, you know, for oh, okay. example, one of the people I'm writing with right now um, is writing a murder mystery set at the turn of the century in New York City with a lot of embalmed babies. It's very <laughs> far away from accidental duchesses, but that doesn't matter because when you're discussing, I don't know how to make this character work or does this sound boring to you? That's something that would probably be my second piece of advice. Hmm. We often write boring, boring fiction and we have to catch that. Yeah. And it's, I think people shelter themselves from that realization because they're like, well, if I'm boring, I have to quit. No, we're all boring. I mean, you know, Hemingway is incredibly boring. He just learned how to hone it down. Yeah. Dickens, I mean, I've been studying Dickens a lot. He can just go on and on. If I was editing Dickens, I would totally splice him out. But, but, but if you look at the notes, you can see him pulling in. Mm -hmm. Like between the serialized version and the novelized version? Okay, I was... Often, I think sometimes some of the cliffhangers weren't necessary anymore once it goes to the novel form, right? Exactly, but he also, he did everything in notes. So he, mm -hmm. he wrote out a chapter and then what's gonna be in it. And you can see him, like, um, I, I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Bleak House. It was gonna be an adulterous relationship. And you know, he got halfway through and he was like, I just don't need that, pull it back. That is yeah. gonna be one thing too many. Interesting. Yeah. So how much how much planning do you do before you launch into a novel? Are, are you a, a pantser or are you a planner? Do you do you have a pretty good outline in place or do you just have an idea and just start writing and go for it? It depends. As I've as I've you know written more books, I tend to be more of a planner, but I can pants if I know where I'm going. And that generally, because I'm writing romance, that'll be the moment when the reader looks up from her book and says, whoa, this relationship is never going to survive. If I know where that is, yes. I can think right to it and after it. If I don't know where it is, I need to set up things much more closely. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, one last question then, Eloisa. What are you working on now or what could we expect from you next? Well, so, um, you know, the Viscount, Viscount in Love comes out at the end of July and I have just turned in the next book which is called Hardly a Gentleman and I received an email yesterday from my editor saying she loves it so oh. yay it's one of those happy moments words yeah that's a it's a lot of fun I'm loving the accidental and accidental brides is fun because these are women who didn't plan to marry for whatever reason end up accidentally married accidentally married to the Viscount, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I I'll just add, I had a lot of fun with that book because when my kids were little, my daughter was writing really violent suspense stories. Low. Kind of like yours, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> maybe. So I, I stole some of her stories. Like she's got this man who had these withered <laughs> heads up on the windowsill and he would run his fingers through their rustling hair. Oh, so wow. That is what the very proper lady finds when she goes to visit the Viscount's new wards. And she says, oh. I can't do it. I'm out of here. I'm looking for <laughs> someone else. And my heroine is like, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Read me I that. Love it. I love that you borrowed that. That's interesting. We have some students, who, uh, some children who are creative and, and artistic and just visiting back and forth, we sometimes borrow ideas from each other or can take something and, and gain inspiration from it. I love it. Yeah, I've done that a lot. I, I wrote a contemporary novel as Mary Bly called Lizzie and Dante. And every chapter that's, that, is, um, that is from the point of view of a young girl has one of the quotes that my daughter had pasted on her door. Oh, That young girl really is based on her. So I think we're very lucky. Yes, because it keeps you. Yes, of, um, in touch yeah. with fresh perspective. Fresh perspective. Every it just keeps it coming. Yes, 
And, and ours have had to put up with a lot, but they've never had to listen to me read King Lear at dinner. So <laughs> they're coming out ahead. Hello, Lisa. Thanks so much for being We need to get you back so we can talk more about Shakespeare and Victorian literature. Absolutely. But for now, thanks for being on the podcast. Just a few parting words since the retreat is about to begin. I'll skip that and move ahead to the big annual event of the year, the WriterCon Conference in Oklahoma City at the Renaissance Waterford Fabulous Hotel over Labor Day weekend, which this year is August 30th to September 2. And what a conference. More than 70 speakers, more than 90 sessions, five tracks of programming throughout most of the day. Even Baxter is excited about it, and he's not even going to get to go. Can you hear that? He is a very excited dog. We got authors, agents, publishers, book marketing experts. They're taking pitches. We have expanded the contest to 13 categories covering both published and unpublished work. Winners get medals, cash prizes. Uh, you might meet the agent you want you might make a friend you're going to keep for the rest of your writing life and as i've probably said before to me that is the best part of writer con hanging out with people who have the same priorities and interests and goals that you do let me also remind you that writer con has its own magazine and you don't want to miss the next issue i can say that with authority because i just proofread it this morning <laughs> and it's got some wonderful articles on breaking issues to subscribe go to substack and search for WriterCon, and you'll see two options you can get a free subscription which will give you the free newsletter every other week or so which has lots of information about breaking news and opportunities for agents or publishing and whatnot or you can go paid subscription, just a few dollars more, and get WriterCon Magazine eight times a year, and you will be so glad you did, all right? Until next time, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.